Welcome one and all as we close out another week here at the Damage Report with me, John Arola, and the host of Happy Half Hour and sometimes other things too, Brad Ehrlich, how's it going? It's going well, I have a promise from Jordan that there will be a game busting tonight. So for the first Which time game in will be forever, busted? what? Which game will be busted? I'm guessing we're just gonna play some Jackie Boxies. Oh, I love Jackie Boxies. <laughs> I could theoretically be a little bit available. I mean, then just if show, you just pop in, dude. Just pop in the yeah. Discord. The dangerous thing about me saying that is you might already have enough people, and then I would be so rejected that I might literally cry no, on jump air in. and never. Okay, we'll talk. Um, and then maybe some Fortnite sees. No, I'm kidding. Uh, it's not my show. Anyway, um, okay. We'll play so, after the show's over. No, we don't hang out outside of Unless content. John's got to go you. back up off of me. Look I'm at this guy, you, everybody. Man. Laugh at this guy. He thinks I'm going to hang out with him if it's not producing content. Anyway, um, you can all mock him, and any particularly good mockery might get you a Blue Apron gift card. Uh, very glad to have you here because we have an awesome show. Uh, awesome, both because there is some truly fascinating news here. What's happening in Texas, the attempted impeachment of their attorney general is, I think, fascinating. We're just at the beginning of that, but we're gonna break down what we know so far. Uh, we've got some QAnon flavored hearings into COVID in Arizona. You know, that'll be fun. <coughs> Apologies. John, stop uh, coughing. I'm not at 100% right now. I am trying not to swoon from the continued allergy dizziness I have. But anyway, uh, we are gonna be starting off the show. Swoon. What's that? Good literal use of swoon. Thank you. Uh, I'm working on my vocabulary. Anyway, um, so we're going to be starting off though with some fun videos. It's not the most important news in the world, but it is fun. And I promise you fun on Fridays. That's why we have Brett here after all. Um, and then of course also garbage people of the week, everybody. There's still time to vote. You want to potentially sway the results or swoon the results. I think it can be used in that context. Anyway, send us your comments and we'll respond as we go. But with all that said, Brett, are you ready to start the show? Indeed. Okay, in that case, let's do it. On the sales tax had a plan to make you pay more. With the sales tax here, and the sales tax there. Here it's happening. There it's happening. Everywhere it's happening. In Congress, Ron DeSantis wanted to replace the current system with a national sales tax. A 23% tax hike on almost everything you buy, from the gas station to the grocery store. You'll pay more here. You'll pay more there. There you'll pay. There you'll pay. Everyone will pay more. We can't afford Ron to sales tax. Make America Great Again, Inc. is responsible for the content of this advertising. I love the ending with the... Anyway, that's uh, that was obviously, as they said, produced by the MAGA Inc. Political Action Committee. And I find it to be a fascinating ad targeting Ron DeSantis for a few different reasons. Um, first of all, it's it's condescending, like it's dismissive. Like it really just fits into what the right wing wants to do when it targets its political enemies. Like he, they are gonna make an absolute mockery out of this guy. He is going to wish he was Jeb with an exclamation point. He's gonna wish that he was little Marco Rubio. Um, so they're attacking him on that. It's substantive, sort of, like they are literally attacking him for something he supported. But being incredibly dishonest about that, We'll break down some of those specifics, but Brett, what did you make of that as a, an attack on Ryan DeSantis? I, they made him trim. Why are they making him so trim, man? <laughs> they did make him trim, that's true. Yeah, meet bobblehead Ron is what they turned him into. Uh, I thought the jib jab <laughs> craze was done, but uh, they brought it yeah. back. Make America great again, circa 2005, jib Make America jab again. <laughs> <laughs> it was definitely jib jab, 100%. Uh, but they did make him trim. I think, like, when you think of a cartoon character, like, the decision to make them look, I don't know, I guess less trim might be able to be seen as like an intentional thing. Maybe they were worried they'd get attacked, or maybe they didn't think about it. I don't know. I mean, if you want to get into it, they like to, they always lean into tr whether you know you're doing it or not, you're leaning most likely into commedia del art tropes. So there's always like you have to a decision to make between like three different kinds of fools, and you either I go see. with the the uh, Scaramucci, you know, Scaramouche, like me 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 me, or you go with like the bumbling <laughs> guy who just keeps stuffing his face. I think with Ron, yeah. what you want is kind of what I've got going on now: a guy who didn't work out but also is starting to get a beer belly. I think that's what they <laughs> yeah they want yeah. That's also this is a 
Comedy Del Art, as we all know, is those three archetypes. You can also find those in the classic NES game uh, Ice Hockey. We have the skinny guy, the medium guy, and the big guy. Yeah, it's based on the comedy Del Art. Hey, that's where anyway, slapstick um, comes from. They used to just hit people with sticks on on stage, so hockey still holds. Nice in that respect. They should bring that back, and probably will. It's weird that that got canceled, but anyway, let's talk about the, the substance of that. So it's basically uh, targeting his support for the Fair Tax Act during his time in Congress, saying that he would make a federal sales tax of 23%. That would obviously be in addition to state sales taxes. Florida's, I, I believe somebody said it was 6%. I don't know for sure, but that sounds about right. Um, it doesn't point out that that would of course be a replacement for income, payroll, estate and gift taxes, which is true. But also like that's not a value neutral thing. Replacing those things with a sales tax is not just like, oh, it works out in the end. No, it's much more intentionally regressive. That would affect poorer people who spend a higher percentage of their income on things that would be taxed by the sales tax than richer people do. That's why some rich people like it. It wouldn't affect the rich as much and more of the money would be generated by poor people. So I guess it is true that they didn't point that out, but also I don't know why they would want to, especially because they're attacking him for this. When many Republicans who, I'm talking about politicians who support Donald Trump have supported some form of a flat tax, a fair tax, whatever they wanna call it, that's what this is. So it's it's so interesting, I don't know how much that's gonna bother Trump supporters who like this tax because they want to see DeSantis go down. But it is interesting that they're doing it in an area where theoretically a lot of their supporters like this. I don't mean regular conservatives, um, although some of them might even. Uh, DeSantis' campaign, by the way, says that it's dishonest, says that he's recently passed a permanent sales tax exemption on baby supplies. So that's good, I guess. But anyway, Brett, what do you think? So this is this is Donald Trump's approach, right? Donald Trump and Ron DeSantis both know that there's this like populist right out there that, you know, doesn't like folks who want to get rid of Medicare and Social Security but also really likes culture war nonsense. And the thing is that Donald Trump does all of that acting like he cares about poor people much better than Ron DeSantis. Yeah. Ron DeSantis is a wiener and Ron DeSantis has been in government longer. Ron DeSantis has, you you can go through more of his history to find things like this that prove that it's all an act. And so anybody who supports a national sales tax over a national income tax only supports taxing poor people more than they tax rich people, right? If you're buying a $10 diaper or a $10 whatever, I guess he wants to exempt baby supplies. But if you're buying a $10 lunch and you only make $100 and you get taxed 1% on 10% on that, you're you're getting taxed 1% of your income on that. If you make $100,000, you're taxed a much lower percent of your income. Yeah. Like a dollar makes up a much lower percent of your income. And so yeah. that's the thing about rich people is they'll always find ways in the same way that they find tax loopholes in our current system. They're trying to, you know, pass this giant handout for them. And Ron and uh, Donald Trump has picked up on that. And you know that as soon as Ron DeSantis got to become the, pro, the governor of Florida, the folks in the Trump administration were like, all right, here's what we're doing. We got to get our oppo file on him. And mm-hmm. uh, they're unleashing it very quickly to try to, to squash this. And the only yeah. rival for the person who can squash it faster is uh, Donald to Donald Trump is Ron DeSantis himself through his stupidity. Yeah, <laughs> yeah in terms of his choices in his campaign. Um, so that's an ad that they're rolling out to attack him. There was another ad that has an attack against DeSantis, and it brings up something that I think we have to address in this particular week. As DeSantis launches his bid to beat Donald Trump, we got to talk about this. So let's jump into this next video. Everyone knows my husband, Ron DeSantis, is endorsed by President Trump, but he's also an amazing dad. Ron loves playing with the kids. Build the wall. He reads stories. Then Mr. Trump said, you're fired. I love that part. He's teaching Madison to talk. Make America great again. People say Ron's all Trump, but he is so much more. Big league, so good. 
Okay, so you probably remember that Ron DeSantis ran it in 2018 and it was a very successful ad for him at that time. Not despite the fact that it is utterly humiliating, but because it's utterly humiliating. They want people who are going to absolutely lay themselves face first on the pavement for Donald Trump. And Ron DeSantis promised his voters that he would do just that. His personality is gone, his political past, his ideology, his positions all gone. Whatever Trump wants is what I want and they loved that. Um, which is good if you want to get elected by supporting Donald Trump. But when you want to get elected by replacing Donald Trump, well, then this is the sort of thing that could potentially hurt you. We knew that it was going to be brought up again. And in fact, it already has been. Take a look at this. Uh, this is an excerpt from an ad that the Trump War Room put out. Why would we ever settle for Trump imposters? Make America great again. When there's only one starting day one who can make America great again. I'm Donald J. Trump and I approve this message. There's only one person who can do this purposefully ill-defined vague thing. But anyway, um, yeah, no, it makes sense. You would, if you're Trump, I would roll that ad out constantly to mock him. It, it, this isn't just like that he sort of has some similarities to Trump, that you could say that he's like a cheap copy. He specifically tried to say, I'm the guy who's gonna help Donald Trump. I'm the guy who loves Donald Trump. Donald Trump is the best. He's so good that I don't even try to teach my kid anything. I just teach my kid Trump and then assume that that will result in a good kid. So I would throw this in his face constantly. We're gonna have his response to it, uh, uh, Brett, but what do you think first? Um, Yeah, I, there's, there's a lot to, to kind of go through and it is this exposes something that I think we all knew was gonna come. I mean, I always kept that when I was producing the shows daily, I always kept that Ron DeSantis B-roll of him doing the build the wall with like fun play blocks with his kid <laughs> because you knew that was gonna come back. Because he absolutely emasculated himself in the face of Trump because the consequences of not doing that were dire. Yeah. And that was the dominant strategy for a bunch of people. And he wanted to get in on that. And he thinks he doesn't have to pay the price for doing that later when he try, he ha, he's gonna have to distinguish himself from Trump. What he's relying on is giant bajillionaire donors who know that Ron DeSantis is only doing an act. But he they they have to bet that Ron DeSantis has to, that is going to actually convince the average voter that Trump light, the, the Trump imitation version is better than Trump. It's just not, I mean, I don't think it's gonna work unless Trump is literally in jail. Yeah, which could be coming. We expect that sometime in August, uh, Fulton County, Fannie Willis will uh, uh, come out with her charges, but we'll see, we'll see how successful that is. Um, again, we're gonna see this ad quite a bit. Here is what Ron DeSantis is saying as this is uh, raised once again. Well, if you watch that, I mean, you know, it was a satirical ad. It was a little tongue in cheek, but that was, you know, many years ago, which is not technically wrong. It was, but it, but satire doesn't work in the same way on the right because it is both obviously over the top, but also attempting, it's received by the base as serious and it has to be presented as serious. But what, the joke making a face. What's going but on? But like, yeah, but the satire in satire, you have there's a joke underneath it. And you know, what's the joke here? The other joke, than him, there there is no joke here. The joke he's serious is what? He likes no, Trump. He is just absolutely like putting on the fool's uniform to please Trump and all of Trump's uh, fans. Yeah. Yeah, and the only other way to interpret that, if you, I mean, his argument has to then be, I never liked Trump, and back then there was something wrong with Trump, and I knew Trump was ridiculous, so I was being ridiculous to expose how ridiculous people are when they absolutely cuck themselves for Trump. Yeah, yeah, and and I, there's no is. other way to look at it. And so the question for Ron is like, what changed then? If you're doing the many years ago thing. What changed? It must be that you don't like Donald Trump. But the problem is you're appealing to to the MAGA voter and they're not gonna buy an argument that says, I don't like Donald Trump. I mean, they're not gonna like it. No, yeah. actually, why don't, why don't we test that? <laughs> so we're gonna turn now to 
uh, one of his attacks. This is the big launch week for Ron DeSantis, obviously. Uh, he is eventually gonna have to attack Donald Trump and he's uh, clearly very nervous about that. But he has trotted out one that could potentially be effective. We knew they were gonna war over this topic, take a look at this. I think he did great for three years, but when he turned the country over to Fauci in March of 2020, that destroyed millions of people's lives. And in Florida, we were one of the few that stood up, cut against the grain, took incoming fire from media, bureaucracy, the left, even a lot of Republicans. Okay, so he turned the country over to Fauci, which is about as big of fighting words as if he had said Biden won in 2020, because that would be acknowledging reality. The other would be acknowledging that Trump technically had someone working for him who didn't want everyone to die. That Fauci didn't necessarily get everything he wanted or whatever, but he thought it was better if someone didn't die from COVID than did, and that is unacceptable, and so Trump should be attacked. now. DeSantis ignores the fact that despite the country being turned over to Fauci, 1.1 million people died of COVID. By the way, Florida did really bad, depending on which numbers you look at. The Miami Herald says they ranked 45th out of 50 states for vaccinations. They had the 12th highest rate of cases and deaths of COVID among the 50 states and Washington DC and Puerto Rico. So they lost 87,000 people as of a month ago. One of them a member of my family, 87,000 Floridians who died. But don't worry, Ron DeSantis now gets to say that he stood up to the liberal media or whatever. Um, He didn't stand up to big funeral, I guess, which stood to gain a lot if he ignored the pandemic. But anyway, he's saying, You could trust me more on stuff like this. And obviously the COVID lockdowns is a stand in for just do you support big government or not? Um, While of course they also believe that government should be able to take your kids away if you're giving them gender affirming care or something. So it's obviously a mixed bag in terms of the politics of it, Brett. But uh, what do you think about this as an attack on Trump? So first of all, it's a lie. The guy locked his state down. April 1st, he ordered a lockdown order 2020. He did comply with Fauci. He handed the keys over to Fauci. And then any wins he won that he's trying to claim for keeping the state quote open, that doesn't really bear out in the facts because a lot of the cities decided that they were gonna issue lockdown orders themselves. Um, so it's a it's an absolute lie. And then also, a lot of the states that that had like non-social distancing orders, people could sit outside because the weather's nice. Like he talked crap about New York. Well, it was freezing and everybody would have to be in the same room together. and People didn't know yeah. what was going on. And then you had a, a governor and Donald Trump himself has kind of even sided with Cuomo and just doing a better job. And what does he point to? Statistics. And then Donald Trump, I mean, the people who follow Donald Trump, don't think that Donald Trump quote handed everything over to Fauci. They think that Donald Trump protected everybody against the Fauci ouchie and won that battle somehow. Why? Because they don't really think these things through. I mean, that's gonna be the 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 job of DeSantis in running for president is he's gonna have to systematically try to dismantle people's love of Trump. But no one's been able to succeed in that. I think in order to succeed, you have to be charismatic. And the, and the one thing that Ron DeSantis is not is charismatic. He's a dopey little my buddy doll that you just wanna grab by the hand and slam against the ground as hard as you can because his face never changes because he's not like this. The doll, not the human, let's be clear about that. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and by the way, like he's, so he is coming out swinging a little bit. I just saw an article that was like, he's attacking Trump like never before, which I guess is true, kind of. Um, but he also announced in the last day that he'll consider pardoning Trump if elected. For I guess everything, anything, whatever, all of the crimes. So. I don't know, is that supposed to appeal to Trump or to the Trump base? I guess it's designed to, I don't know that Trump is gonna love DeSantis saying, don't worry buddy, once I defeat you in my quest to become president, I'll save you from going to the slammer. Maybe, maybe that makes him feel better. But anyway, I also saw there's a couple, there's a new scandal that's in the news and we're gonna look up the details of that as more develops. I saw. He followed up his Twitter spaces launch on Twitter by signing a bill that would exempt space flight explosion liability. 
So if Elon Musk's rockets explode and kill people or like come crashing down and kill people or whatever, he'll be protected from liability. Maybe that's just a normal thing that you should have. It seems sort of weird that it's signed so close to him teaming up with Elon Musk for Twitter. He signed the bill, of course, that lets him run for president and stay governor and his flights are gonna be protected from disclosure. Uh, donors visiting his house are gonna be protected from disclosure. Like this guy is supposed to be a less personality based tin pot authoritarian than Trump. But I don't know in terms of his personal relationships, his payback to donors and supporters, the way that he uses the legislature to personally benefit just to him. I don't know, I think he gives Trump a run for his money. Any final thoughts? Well, he doesn't have as much money as Trump, but he's gonna try to that's get true. it from billionaires. And that's literally his strategy for fundraising is billionaire, is billionaire money. He's going on Twitter and appealing to Silicon Valley billionaires who and, and try to get cash. And that's why he went to the, and he wants, you know, if there's any value left in anyone's crypto, he wants the crypto bros to give him dark yeah. money and he wants to get dark money from super PACs. That's literally his, his approach because he's not actually a populist. He's absolutely 100% like a, the, a, a, he is the deep state that they're afraid of. He's the person pretending to support the MAGA folks with the sole purpose of destroying Donald Trump. Like that's, that's what he's doing right now. So he is their biggest fears exposed. And if I'm if I'm an, a Republican who cares about all the things that Donald Trump pretends to care about, I'm kind of nervous because in trying to go on Twitter, Twitter has appeased the censorship requests reportedly of like 85% of the yep. requests that they've been given to censor by giant governments. And so you know, Elon Musk further exposed himself as just doing an act with Ron DeSantis who's just doing an act. So they can get in there and, and make your life more dangerous so that you can get killed by giant corporations who don't care about you and never did. Yeah, still though, Twitter is the home of free speech mm -hmm. because you're allowed to tweet the N word a bunch, I suppose. Yeah, that's that's that's, that's what that's the founding really fathers really what had in mind. Well, maybe actually, <laughs> but anyway, uh, with that said, why don't we go to our first break? Uh, when we come back, we got some crazy hearings going on in Arizona. We're gonna see what we can learn from that, but we'll be right back. And I say that not because the kid can't or whatever, but that kid's definitely way too young in that Ron DeSantis had to be learning to read, right? I don't know a lot about kids and I should probably figure it out since I'm having they one. They can read. But I think at that age, they can read body language, dude. It's all about the energy you give them. And if you're nervous, they you're gonna have a nervous kid. But if you're confident, you just throw them in the pool and help, and they'll still float. Just let them run around. You're not, you're not babysitting. Teach them to okay. do chores. With that said, I'm gonna teach you to do a chore, and the chore is talking about the B block. Let's jump into this. Senate Republicans are launching a committee to investigate Arizona's COVID-19 pandemic response. And I believe this will be the most important and most powerful committee hearing the Arizona State Senate has ever convened. The novel Coronavirus Southwestern Intergovernmental Committee is intended to shine a light on the mismanagement of the COVID-19 pandemic and expose all the atrocities committed during the pandemic response. To be very clear, when they say that atrocities were committed, they do not mean that policies were set up in a way that many people still got sick and died. In fact, according to what I'm seeing, 33,190 deaths in Arizona. One in 219 people died there. He, he doesn't mean that, they don't mean that. They just mean that people wore masks, there was social distancing, maybe it was locked down for 72 hours or something. Uh, and I have strong reason to suspect that because here is what this uh, body that's gonna be looking into the atrocities is. It is a new state Senate body, the novel coronavirus Southwestern Intergovernmental Committee. Now, if that seems like a needlessly long tortured name for the committee, there's a reason for it. It's so that the acronym for it can be NCSWIC. Now, why would that matter? Well, to a normal person, it means nothing. But to QAnon people, it stands for nothing can stop what is coming. And the fact that this is an official investigative body by the state Senate of Arizona that is named to appeal to conspiracy theorists that believe that the government is run by Satanists who drink the blood of babies, seems like it'd be a big deal. But I guess that's just Arizona at this point. 
Um, it apparently is used that acronym by QAnon people to say that nothing can stop basically the deep state being taken down. There is nothing these QAnon people love more than a vague acronym that they think properly stands in for a coherent worldview. Anyway, uh, they've got people who are coming in um, that you might consider pretty crazy, Paul Gosar, Andy Biggs. There are others too that might not be that bad. It's not like they're directly bringing in like Q himself or anything, but it is clearly biased in that direction. I God only knows what they're gonna find, Brett, but we know it's gonna be crazy. I mean, what's so frustrating is like, these folks have made it so much a part of their identity to use words like atrocity about like people just saying like, can we try not to kill each other? And to them, that's an atrocity. When I look back on COVID, I remember you know on the COVID lockdown and pandemic and and everything that we put in place as a result of this disease. I have to remind myself like there were a lot of diseases that came into the media sphere previous to that, like SARS and bird yeah. flu and swine flu that didn't result in this kind of a thing. So it's not like this knee jerk reaction of the entire state to just shut everything down. But this did kill an unprecedentedly high number of people. And in the wake of that, what you have to ask yourself what a reasonable person would do. A reasonable person would say, let's try not to kill everybody. And so they put it in place until they could, you know, if if the right wing is like, we gotta shut down immigration until we can figure out what the hell's going on. That's what America did. They shut down things until they could figure out what the hell was going on. Now, they're gonna go through and they're gonna find things that were actually mistakes that were mm -hmm. put in place by government. And that's fine. But I don't want the person in charge of labeling what's a mistake versus what's an atrocity to be the same person who uses QAnon acronyms to put together their freaking committee. I look at them, I know who they are. They are who we thought they were. They're telling us who they are every single day. These guys should not be the ones in charge of investigating this thing. Mm -hmm. These folks are unhinged psychopath Satanists. I'll say it, they're Satanists. Um, they're not uh, Satanists, why not like that? But um, yeah, yeah, look, they, they might find some ways that uh, the response was ineffective or whatever. But fundamentally, other than just the Q stuff, which already means that there's no point for this body. Um, they, you have to bear in mind, they did not want a more effective response, fundamentally. They didn't, want, like if they find A, B and C that weren't as effective as they could have been or that wasted money or whatever. They don't want those replaced with DEF that are more effective at stopping COVID because they did not care if COVID killed people. And the issue too, and I know we don't talk about COVID nearly as much as we used to. Obviously for years of TDR, that was our daily show effectively. They don't accept that it was bad. They don't, they'll temporarily accept that it was bad if they think that that'll briefly hurt Biden. But then they go right back to, they don't think that it was bad. They think less should have been done. They don't believe that these people died fundamentally. Occasionally they will think that these people died if they think that they can blame that on China leaking it. Then those people died and China killed them. But other than that, they don't accept that it was a bad thing. They don't accept like it was the worst domestic disaster of our entire lives. Indisputable to anyone with three functioning neurons to rub together <laughs> and they don't accept anything. Any of this, any of the reality of what happened in the past few years, they wish that more people had died. They honestly don't care, and that is insane. Look at this; they're they're teaming up. They're teaming up with RFK Jr.'s anti-vax nonprofit, the Children's Health Defense. They've got these experts who, uh, let's see, we've got. Uh, I don't even care. I don't even care. <laughs> They're crazy people. They're, they honestly believe the disease comes from Satan. What's the difference? This is what government becomes when either people aren't paying attention, or even if they are, the guardrails against democracy are so effectively in place that you still end up with crazy people. Thanks to redistricting, which affects not only the Congress but also state legislatures. This is what you get. Anyway, I think they should quick re, final for you. I think they should re. Cues themselves. <laughs> anyway, um, 
Coming from the Rand Corporation, they basically asked uh, these veterans of different branches of service what they think about different conspiracy theories. And I don't know what number like supporting the theories I would be comfortable with or you should be comfortable with. But I will say that the ones they found, I'm not. So of those surveyed, 17.9% of Air Force veterans, 17.4% of Marine Corps veterans answered that they completely or mostly agree with the QAnon conspiracy theory. That's right about slightly higher than the public at large. One would hope that it would either be the same as the public at large, or maybe there would be something about you being the sort of person that has been given the duty, responsibility, and training to defend our nation, that you would be more critical in the way that you think about these things. But unfortunately, it's not what this shows. Um, that's QAnon. On uh, the Great Replacement Survey, let's see, you have. Uh, they asked a group of people in this country trying to replace native born Americans with immigrants and people of color who share their political views. 39.4% of Marine Corps veterans, 30% effectively of Navy, 30% of Air Force, 26% of Army believe that. That is several percentage points higher than the general population. They believe that they're, but bear in mind, to believe any of this, you have to believe that there is this cabal in charge of everything that makes decisions like who is going to be in the country, who is going to be able to be a voter, that sort of thing. They apparently do believe that, and they believe that they're being replaced. Again, they'll never define what replaced is supposed to mean. Where are the white people going? It's just more people. They're not being replaced, but those are the numbers. What do you think? I'm, I'm trying to fix my mic. The, I think the, you the need to rotate thing. it 180 degrees. Um, no, so I, I understand that. It's just, it's giving me trouble. I'm just, sorry, I, I won't help you. Do you want me not to help don't. you? I can sit here and oh, no, wait no, no. until you fix it. No, to be clear, you're not helping me. <laughs> you're trying. But in a uh, fun way. The thing is busted, the thing is busted. There we go. I don't know if it's gonna stay, but anyway. It's all I right. was yanking it as hard as I could. What do you want out of me? Jesus, that's not to talk like that. Don't go use phrasing. What are your thoughts? It's Friday. My thoughts everyone. are just you Please talking the fact that you just kept you said yanking it as hard as I can. I don't think any of us can think of anything well, else. Technically, technically, mm. you just said it too. <laughs> That's just as clippable. Uh, um, yeah, so when, when people, I, people I always have this thing with surveys. Like people can say that they believe in uh, the conspiracy theory. I think folks are just so monumentally bored. And they have such a monumental amount of imagination. And yeah. I think it's fine to believe in this stuff. Like I believe in aliens and ghosts and all this stuff. As long as you're not going to be have your, your hand, which might be on the levers of power, influenced by this actual belief that Hillary Clinton is drinking baby unicorn blood or whatever. <laughs> Like, like Voldemort, we trust tons of people who believe that like God magic humped a Jewish 14 year old and she had a baby in a barn and he saved your life. So you can live for forever and eternity. People walk around, billions of people walk around believing that all day. Billions I mean, of people walk around being people. like, yo, so this guy just ascended to heaven. And that's it, but don't draw his picture. Billions of people believe in some pretty outlandish stuff. Yeah. But like the fundamentals of this country in particular are that those weird ass beliefs that are mythical in nature, much like Hillary Clinton and cosmic pizza and unicorn blood, those things cannot, must not affect how you run the country. Yeah. And it's fine. Everyone goes on. I believe in the Greek and Roman gods because they're so goddamn fun. They are. I'm not going to use that to say that I get to dress as a swan and rape people. Yeah, you can do the first half of that if you want. All day. I think there's probably a very high chance that you have at some point. But if but they sell that costume at Target, they're gonna get it banned. Yeah. 100%. Um, anyway, uh, the issue is that this stuff doesn't necessarily directly pose any kind of threat, believing a crazy thing. I think that it eventually does, but it doesn't necessarily. Um, but the, the poll also found that when it comes to political violence defined as, uh, quote, because things have gotten so far off track, true American patriots may have to resort to violence in order to save our country. 27.9% of Marine vets, almost 21% of Navy vets, 16.4% of Air Force vets, and 14.1% of Army vets 
agree with that. The mainstream, oh, mainstream America, they just mean most Americans, it's at 19%, which is obviously way too high. Those numbers for any of the groups are too high. It is amazing how different they are though. The Marines that were polled were twice as likely as the members of the army to support that. And that is fascinating and also much scarier because these people have training. These people might have weapons and they believe that well, things are off track in some vague way. So I guess we gotta start shooting people potentially. It doesn't mean that they will, but it means that they might be predisposed to be okay with it if it does happen anyway. With that said, um, I think we have to move on to our C block because I want to get to everything today. So why don't we jump uh, into this? Texas's attorney general is, this won't surprise you, a Republican, Ken Paxton. And this might surprise you, he might be impeached. What will definitely surprise most people who haven't been following his story is that he's gonna be impeached by Republicans. That's the only way that it could work. Texas is dominated by Republicans and they're pushing for him to be impeached from his position. Uh, Texas House committee voted yesterday to recommend that he be impeached. Hours later, the Republican led House General Investigating Committee recommended 20 different articles of impeachment, including for alleged bribery, obstruction of justice and abuse of public trust. Uh, the sort of charge that would probably fit almost any politician in Texas, but they're starting with him, so that's good. Anyway, there was detailed testimony earlier this week from a team of investigators who've been looking into Ken Paxton, uh, former prosecutors who were hired by the committee to look into allegations of corruption against him. So many of the charges relate to ways that Mr. Paxton has used his office to benefit donors and then fire those in the office who spoke up against his actions. The Texas House of Representatives could vote today on this. In fact, they might be voting right now, like literally as we're live. If impeached, that's obviously not the end. There would be a trial in the Senate like there is when people are impeached at the federal level, but he would have to step down temporarily. What is fascinating about this to me, Brett, is that they, like I generally have very low standards for Republicans holding other Republicans to account. There's obviously extenuating circumstances that I think free them up ideologically to oppose this guy. Because what they're alleging that he did it, like accepting bribes, benefiting his donors, like let thee who is without sin, Texas legislators, but but that's what they're going after him for. So what do you what do you make of this? I just love watching him fight personally. Um, and you know, this is a guy who I, I just like to know where they draw the line because apparently Paxton's impeachment situation revolves around like extramarital affairs with his staff and in addition to accepting bribes. Um, and it's like with a real estate developer allegedly employing the, the woman with whom he had the affair in exchange for legal help. Like they still like a little, you know, allegedly, they still like a little, a little there's there's a there's a certain kind of Republican where they're gonna entertain the notion of holding him to account for, for acting quote immorally. Mm -hmm. um, not to mention in all these states where they're like throwing people out for lack of decorum, you've got people like showing up drunk to the state legislature. And doing things that are are completely um, outside the bounds of you know way worse than what they're getting mad at other folks for. So I think yeah. that with Paxson, I mean I I hope they impeach him, get rid of him. He's horrible. I hate to see who they get to replace him, but um, in the meantime, go for it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, by the way, uh, for context, uh, he was reelected twice despite being under indictment on felony securities fraud charges. He's well, also like, under investigation Scott. by the FBI over bribery claims. Look at Rick Scott in Florida. He is a senator from the state of Florida whose company engaged in the largest proven medic Medicare fraud in the history of the United States, basically. Yeah. And they're it's fine crazy with it. We'll, because there's a big we'll R next to her name, his name. But that's kind of that's a, a state that sometimes maybe they're still afraid might skew purple, um, even though it's been red for a while. But you know, in Texas, they feel pretty confident that they yeah. can keep it. And so why not go after the guy? Oh, 100%. And they will get an absolute weirdo in that position. Don't worry. But we'll we'll see if they do the vote this week um, or today, I should say. Uh, in any event, we do have to take our second break. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. You know what? Um, we're in the live show right now. But you know what? There's a lot of gifting going on, on Twitch anyway. I'm going to acknowledge it. Tree Move Tiki gifted five subs. Thank you. Poodle Hat Dragon gifted one. Thank you. Brandy Lou two gifted five. You're all the best. It's just so nice. 
Okay, uh, with that said, Oh dear, let's move into this. Meanwhile, if you're a Trump supporter who happened to be at the Capitol on January 6th, you face exorbitant bail, solitary confinement, abusive jail guards, and no due process. That was Marjorie Greene speaking out in defense of what she considers to be political prisoners, those who rioted on January 6th and were locked up. She sometimes calls them prisoners of war. Well, they're the only ones that did the attacking, so I feel like you're making a case against them in that label. And but they still lost. Event, and still lost, of course. Uh, it's good to win a war. But anyway, uh, she was pointing out that they haven't been treated well. Abusive guards, solitary confinement. I don't know how true that is of these individual prisoners, but it is definitely the case that this is significant. And I've felt for the last two years that she's been talking about this that, hey, Maybe we can come together and have some actual bipartisanship and fight back against these abuses. Now, I am very much obviously wasting my time because she doesn't actually care about those things affecting people who didn't riot on January 6th. But in principle, she's on our side. Maybe we can push her. In any event, we have an opportunity. We're gonna jump ahead to graphic three because in Nevada, Lawmakers are reconsidering limits on how state prisons use solitary confinement there. They had previously tried a couple of years ago to do this. This is pretty significant though, this sort of rollback of solitary confinement for the you know, the best interests of prisoners. The bill defines segregation or solitary confinement as more than 22 consecutive hours in a cell. Would limit the use to 15 consecutive days after which you have to have a mental health clinician and others conduct a review to determine where to place the inmate rather than just leaving them there forever. They would also be restricted from placing a person in solitary confinement who is 90 days or less from their release. What they found by the way in I guess the research for this is that about 10% of Nevada's prison population is in solitary confinement at any given time. That is much higher than I think most people would expect. 57 people had been in restrictive housing for more than a decade at that point. And it's not evenly distributed, 40% of trans prisoners are in solitary confinement. In some cases, perhaps for their protection, which is its own issue of abuse and all of that. But uh, those who are advocating for you know, the rights of prisoners are saying that this is a very significant potential step. Uh, it's not the only solution that you could have and it hasn't yet been passed. But Brett, it is good to see at least this sort of discussion. Generally, anything that you try to do that would protect the interests of prisoners is immediately attacked as being like soft on crime or something. And so um, a major trend in any kind of justice reform is people kind of jumping on bandwagons and not really understanding the fundamental issues or the fundamental solutions that are advocated that are actually in line with your ideology. And rather people just kind of, you know, you get politicians that, that kind of jump on as the leader of the bandwagon. And then they just want to score political points, so they'll get like the they they'll get the the a law that can be considered a win passed, but it won't actually fix anything. And I'm pretty sure that's what Marjorie Taylor Greene's trying to do. She doesn't want to delve into the specifics of what solitary confinement does to any kind of prisoner when they're placed in solitary confinement. She doesn't want to delve into the specifics of trans individuals being victims of battery in prisons at a disproportionate clip when compared to non trans individuals. And she doesn't want to get into that. But that doesn't mean you can't harness the instinct behind it to get the actual positive change made. So there's all these things that happen in Congress all the time. You'll see AOC and Matt Gates get together with Ro Khanna and talk about getting rid of corporate money in politics. That's mm-hmm. fine if you can harness the instinct to get a law passed that materially improves conditions in a way in line with actual tangible improvement of a system, then great. Um, but yeah. I, you know, that's the that's the hardest thing to do because you know you have to you have to very deftly convince Marjorie Taylor Greene you're on her side, but at the last second, like make the legalese so complex that she doesn't understand you just protected people from atrocities within prison systems. Yeah. Yeah, and you'd have to do that because she wouldn't be willing to make this change that would benefit the January 6th prisoners if it meant that it would also benefit other prisoners. Right. Like she would rather that they remain in solitary so long as other people remain in solitary. Yeah. And even if you're a conservative, you know that that's true. Anyway, balls in Marge's court.
So we'll see, we'll see. But anyway, good on Nevada for at least looking into it. That said, let's talk about one more topic that remains of the first hour, starting with this. A study was done a little while ago on the federal judiciary. I wish we had these studies for all other appointments by the Biden administration. And apparently his first two years, President Biden had appointed 97 federal judges. Of the 97 federal judges, I was expecting maybe 25 or 30 were white guys. Because I know President Biden wasn't heavy on appointing more white guys. Five of the 97 judges were white guys. Of those, two were gay. So... Um, almost impossible for a white guy who's not gay, apparently, to get appointed here. So that's Glenn Grothman, which actually is what I would have guessed his name was had I not known. Um, he's very annoyed that you can't become a judge if you're white. Sorry, and straight. For some reason, if you're white and gay, that doesn't count. I guess even for a white nationalist, that's not good enough. Um, but anyway, he's aggrieved about the way that Biden is going about choosing his nominees. He thinks it's unfair. Uh, his numbers are also wrong, not like wildly off, but they're not accurate. I doubt that's gonna bother him. So let's take a look at what Biden has actually done. And let's see if we can determine if Biden is being unfair to white judges. So here is uh, at this certain point in their presidency, how many judges uh, different presidents have uh, been able to confirm, which by this, even with Dianne Feinstein sort of screwing the, the Democrats over for a while, uh, Biden is still leading the pack way more than Obama was able to. And uh, he's still technically got some more presidency. We'll see how effective it is. And when you break it down, yes, he was disproportionately uh, nominating and confirming uh, people of color, women, about two out of every three for both of those categories. And you can directly compare it to the past presidents. Uh, for Trump, people of color represented just 16% of those confirmed by Trump. So not a priority, obviously, that is like disproportionately low compared to the population. Uh, it was only 36% under Obama. One in four were women under Trump, 42% under Obama. So he was doing a little bit better. Trump was obviously going out of his way to screw them over. Um, but what you have to bear in mind is, like that's what has happened over the last 800 days. But that doesn't necessarily represent just what he thinks he would always need to do. He is trying to balance the scales, I guess, of justice in this case. Because if you look at the American Bar Association, they found that only 4% of federal judges were black women. 78% are white men. Of the 68 judges that Biden has appointed, they don't include 29 he's appointed since, two are white men. So what he's trying to do is balance it out just a little bit. And Glenn Grothman, of course, is not gonna give you the numbers for how for the judges that are out there, what sort of diversity or lack there is, there is out there in the population. He's only gonna talk about the newer ones because he doesn't want you to realize that white men have very much done just fine when it becomes comes to becoming a judge historically. What do you think, Brett? I mean, this is the this is a moral question that everybody has, like philosophically, is like, how do you solve a problem? Because the solution to something that's been unjust for a while is to undo that injustice. But in undoing that injustice, you open yourself up for the possibility of dudes like this to make this complaint. Like, mm -hmm. it's been so unrepresentative for so long. And even Republicans will be like, no, I totally get it. Someone will say there's racism in the system. And yeah, it's it's disproportionate. But when you pass like an actual solution over time that isn't completely, it doesn't necessarily result in unqualified people getting appointed. Like they, it's that you have to question folks on the Republican side. Like, well, then how do you solve a problem like this? And they'll never give you a way to solve it that doesn't involve someone just utilizing their power the way he wants mm -hmm. to utilize it. And for Biden, this is great. This is great. this is exactly the kind of stuff that the Republicans do on the other side, where it's like it does, it's no skin off his ashtabula to you know uh, appoint somebody who is you know, on paper will make the same decisions as a white male, and also at the same time uh, you know shores up his is delivers on a promise he made. Those are hard to come by delivering on a promise that he made. And that's a good kind of pressure that you can make politically is to result in, in actual tangible results that, that close a divide like this or close a gulf like this that has existed as John pointed out. 
Yeah, 100%. And uh, to close, uh, yeah, I have no doubt that almost every right winger would consider this to be an unacceptable way to solve the problem of lack of representation amongst those groups. But I believe that most of them, if you ask them, well, what if there was only 5% of white men? Do you feel like we should nominate more to close the gap? I have a feeling they'd be okay with it. Be right back. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.